In this section, we'll take a look at the timers available on the MSP430 F5XX. Each and every MSP430 has a timer on board. The timers are a asynchronous 16-bit timer counter uh, with a variety of modes, uh, up, down, up, down, uh, we'll go over those in just a second here, and clockable by a variety of different clocks. There are multiple, uh, and depending on which uh, timer you have, anywhere from three to, to many more than that, multiple capture and compare registers, and the ability to synthesize PWM outputs. The timers can generate uh, interrupts. Uh, there's an interrupt vector register for fast decoding, and they can also trigger DMA transfers. The timer has several different counting modes. Continuous, where the uh, timer just continually counts up from zero to uh, its maximum value and then goes over from there. Uh, up, where it counts from zero up to the value that you've put in counter compare register zero. Up, down, where it counts from zero up the counter register, uh, counter compare register zero, back down, back up, and so on. Um, I gotta tell you, I don't think stop and halt is really a counting mode. Timer B interrupts, uh, there are a limited number of interrupts that go into the MSP430 CPU, and this, this um, uh, applies to both timer A and timer B. The timer B counter compa uh, compare, uh, excuse me, the timer B capture comparison register zero interrupt flag creates a single interrupt vector that goes to the, uh, that goes to the CPU. The same thing applies to timer A. If you're looking at the other counter compare registers on timer B, that would be one through six, and the timer B interrupt flags, all those are prioritized and combined using the timer B interrupt vector register into another interrupt vector. This, the timer B1 register. So all those interrupts go into a single, into a, uh, into a single MUX, come in, interrupt the CPU. Now you're going to have to have some handler code to go out and to determine which timer B or, in, or also which timer A interrupt triggered you. There are some differences between timer B and timer A. Uh, in its default functionality, timer B is identical to timer A, um, but timer B has 8, 10, 12, or 16-bit timer counters. Timer A is only a 16-bit timer. Uh, the outputs are double buffered on timer B for simultaneous loading. Uh, the uh, counter and compare registers on timer B uh, can be grouped for simultaneous updates if you're doing something like PWM very quickly. And the timer B trice, uh, external pin can be tri-stated. Lab 4 uses a timer to reduce the current consumption of the timer measurement application. The main loop over here uh, same initialization as before. Uh, we're we're uh, holding the watchdog, initializing the GPO, initializing the ADC12 in the reference, initializing the 32 kilohertz uh, crystal, and then basically we go to sleep. So we're going to wait for the timer interrupt service routine to go off at that point. So in this case, you're going to spend uh, some significant amount of time waiting for the timer to go off. So over here, when the timer goes off, counter compare register zero, we turn on the reference, uh, we go ahead and delay 75 microseconds for the internal reference to settle, we enable and trigger the conversion, and then we exit active from LPM3. So what we're doing is, in the timer, we're uh, doing the two second delay between samples, and we're doing the, uh, here, we're doing the 75 microsecond settling time. Now this is in software. And you can see when we come out of LPM3, we're going to have to wait for the conversion to be completed. That's where we come back right here. So we have to wait for the conversion. This is also a poll, not a timer. We disable any further conversions, disable the internal reference, read out our, uh, our uh, uh, temperature and voltage, process it, go back to sleep. So while this is good, we're doing the uh, two second timer over here in uh, timer CCR0. What we're not doing is we're not using the timer to delay this uh, for the settling time uh, or the amount of time it takes to do the conversion. So this is going to save a pretty significant amount of current, but not the maximum that we can possibly save. Lab 4 power is going to be significantly less than Lab 3 was, primarily because we're using the timer to do the two second delay. So instead of being active at one megahertz the entire time, drawing 290 microamps, 
for the majority of those two seconds will be down at 2.1 microamps. So the CPU is in low power mode 3 most of the time. The delay between the ADC samples gets handled by the hardware, but what we're doing here is we're turning on the reference, we're waiting in software, we're doing, turning on the conversion, we're waiting the conversion, we're doing the processing, all of that's done in software. So that's going to cause us to, uh, to burn some additional current that we may not need to do. We can take a look at that in Lab 5. So the ADC-12 timing is completely handled in software. The, the reference settling, the software trigger, and the polling of the uh, bits. Lab 4 implements the same application as Lab 3 did, but uses a timer peripheral to allow the CPU to sleep during the two second delay between readings. This is going to save a lot of power. Lab 4 is going to do the same application, but in this case it's going to use timer interrupts. We'll handle the two second delay instead of doing it with a, uh, with a delay loop on the CPU, we'll do it with a hardware timer interrupt. This is going to end up saving a ton of power on the board. So following along in the, in the workbook, go to step one in the procedure. We need to set lab four as the active project. You can go ahead and minimize lab three. Set lab four as the active project. Now, if you take a look, uh, make sure that uh, lab4.c is excluded from the build. And make sure that the solution here is included. So at this point, we can uh, close any of the other open editor panes that you had and open the lab4.c solution file for editing. Take a look through the code as shown below in step three that's used to integrate the LPM3, uh, the timer, timer B, and so on to initialize all these events. So we need to, since the board is being powered through the multimeter, I'll reach over and turn on the multimeter to power the board. And we'll click the debug in Code Composer to download the code to the board. So the code is downloading to the board. And I can click Run to make sure that it's working. At this point, we'd like to make sure that the board is, is actually sending information back up. So down in the terminal window, down here at the bottom, this is, if you're following along, this is step six. We can clear this to get rid of the information from before and reconnect by clicking this connect button right here. It will connect. And now you can see we're getting information back up from the board. Again, I can take my finger, rub it on my pants to warm it up and put it on the top of the chip. It was at 102, now it's at 108. 108, take my finger off, and the temperature will start to drop. Again, that temperature is not calibrated, so that's not the real temperature of the device. So for the current measurement in step eight, we want to go ahead and reach over and disconnect the JTAG cable from the board. I'll click the terminate all right here and I'll disconnect this. Okay, in step 10, we'll take a look at the amount of current that's being drawn here. Uh, since this is going to be changing pretty significantly, uh, you can observe the current consumption on your meter, but because of the timer delay and the meter's inability to read these quickly changing currents, uh, your readings are going to jump around quite a lot. If you look at the graph in step 10, you can see that the baseline current should be somewhere around 2.1 microamps. And in this case, we're getting oh, around 2.2 microamps on the meter. And it quickly jumps up to some other value. That value is the time that it takes to turn the clock on, uh, set the reference, and actually do the measurement uh, before we go back to sleep. So in this case, we're getting a, uh, for the majority of that two second time, we're getting something like a 2.2 microamp current for the majority of the time period. So your job as a programmer to, is to make sure that your CPU is in the lowest possible uh, power saving mode, in this case LPM3, the majority of the time. 
The delay between the samples is handled by the hardware so the CPU can allow it uh, itself to sleep. So now you can reach over, turn off the multimeter, and uh, reconnect the JTAG cable.